issues. We are going to record tonight's event, but only the speakers will be present on the video, okay? And we'll keep everybody else muted throughout the presentation and the discussion. If you have any, any questions that you want to ask, please ask them in the chat box. I will look through them later and we, we will get a chance to get to most of them, hopefully. Good evening and welcome to this special evening in collaboration with the American Library in Paris. I'm Beth Austin, I'm president of AAWE. As Kirsty said, uh, the Association of American Women in Europe, or AAWE, is a bicultural community of American women, mostly. We're primarily in France, but also in Europe and around the world. And we are celebrating our 60th birthday this year. AAWE has been a strong advocate and a driver in acquiring citizenship rights and voting rights for Americans living overseas. Today, we provide a network of support for both personal and professional activities throughout the different stages of life. To keep our 500 vibrant, diverse members engaged and connected and in touch with their community, we hold school fairs, retirement fairs, we organize cultural outings, we publish themed magazines, we write books specific to living in France. We organize social events such as plant exchanges, elegant evenings, themed happy hours, new member cocktails. We have begun two new initiatives over the past two years, which are the Empowered Women Speaker Series and Les Historiennes, a series of lectures, discussions, guided walks and museums visits, museum visits. They're all centered on certain periods of French history. We have a wonderful website and are present on Facebook and Instagram. All of our social, educational and cultural activities are the way we create community and support among American women and other individuals, American or not, who have joined our group because they live in France for the long term. AAW members have created strong bonds of friendship. Members are often with us for two generations. They often bring in their own children. We are unique in that we have members in their 20s and members over 100. So if you'd like to know more about us, you can take a stroll through our website. Now, you may be, or not, wondering about AAW's which school fair, which usually takes place every other spring. For the moment, and as you can imagine, we are waiting to find out how current events evolve for spring 2022 to see if we'll be able to safely hold this event. Fingers crossed. In the meantime, you can find updates on all our education events by liking our Facebook page or going to our blog um, I'll put the website and the, well, the website and the blog addresses will, put, will be put in the chat after this. Now, for a few words about our AAWE Guide to Education in France. The guide has been a service from the volunteers at AAWE to bilingual families for 35 years through nine editions. The brand new ninth edition from 2021 includes listings. Be ready. Over 300 schools across France, including bilingual and international schools and international sections within regular schools, public and private schools, extension programs offering Wednesday English lessons for bilinguals, preschool through high school, maternelle to lycée. As well as contact details, there's information on fees, curriculum, diplomas offered, the school schedule, holiday camps, Wednesday programs offered, transport facilities, extracurricular activities, facilities, the school goals and philosophies, lunch, arrangement, lunch arrangements, and student numbers. That's a lot, and there's more. There's a glossary of terms and acronyms which translate French educational jargon to English. The astounding, the awesome French school supplies list is translated to English. And we have written six pages of sample notes to the teacher for smooth communication with your child's educators. And wait, that's not all. As I said, we have a blog and it has a map of all the schools in the guide. Plus it contains a regular update articles on helping bilinguals thrive, students with special needs, when to seek an evaluation, best books to read before you grow up, reading with bilinguals, choosing a school system for the bicultural child and an overview of the French education system. And let me just say, all of that knowledge can be yours for just 17 euros if you collect it from our office on Avenue de New York on the other side of the Seine from the library. 
or 22 euros, including shipping to France. There's a link for that and that'll be put in the chat also. So I'd like to thank you for coming to this event this evening. I hope you'll learn some very interesting information for your bilingual children. And now I'll hand back to Celeste. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm Celeste Rhodes, Children's and Teen Services Manager here at the American Library in Paris. We're very pleased to host this event in cooperation and collaboration with AAWE. And I'm pleased that Anjali Murad could join us to speak about bilingualism and the brain. Anjali has a bachelor's degree in human biology and a master's degree in psychology from Stanford University and a doctorate in psychology and behavioral neuroscience from McGill University. Her research interests include perception of all things auditory, including emotion in music, in music and speech. Since her arrival in Paris in 2010, she's been increasingly interested in bilingualism and its neuroscientific basis from an intellectual as well as a personal perspective, raising three bilingual kids of her own. She is currently a freelance writer and editor specializing in scientific and children's literature. Please join me in welcoming Anjali. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Before we begin, let's define some terms. So we're going to be talking about bilingual children and the brain tonight, but do you think that we could effectively consider this a discussion about bilingual and multilingual children? Is there a difference in your opinion? It, no, everything we talk about, when we say bilingual, it can also apply to multilingual kids learning three or more languages. It's all, it's all relevant. It's just that kids who have more languages are going to have less exposure time in each of those languages. And we'll talk about exposure and how that's really important probably um, later on. Um, I think we're both expecting a lot of people here who are actively involved in raising bilingual children. And many of our guests here might be hearing conflicting suggestions about how best to proceed. Mm -hmm. I've heard from many parents that they've been told even in 2021, that learning two or more languages might be detrimental to their child's language development. What's your response to that? Could you tell us more about bilingual <laughs> neuroscientific basis? Um, yeah, so people used to think that bilingualism was detrimental to development and we can sort of understand why they would think that because these kids, unlike monolingual kids that are more common in, in many cultures, not everywhere, um, they're exposed to a lot more input and it comes from different sources. It's not necessarily clear which language is which. And they have to sort out all of this stuff that other kids may not have to sort out. But that said, it does not cause any delays. There's no evidence of any problems from um, being exposed to more than one language. And this includes kids who have a language delay themselves. There's lots of research showing that uh, kids with autism spectrum disorders, um, specific language impairment, uh, Down syndrome, they, if they have a problem in language, they'll have the same problem in all of their languages, but bilingualism will not make this problem worse. That's probably very reassuring to hear for some parents and um, just extra backup for those who might be familiar with some of those research, but it's an interesting perspective coming. From and, and if you hear this from a professional, I would recommend just smiling and nodding and then going to get a second opinion because they probably won't change their mind. <laughs> Could you um, give us some insight into how the brain processes language? You just touched on that a little bit, but. Does a bilingual speaker represent each language in different areas of the brain? It can depend on uh, when the kid or adult learned the language uh, for the first time when they started learning it. So for there are two types of bilinguals, there's simultaneous bilinguals and sequential bilinguals. Simultaneous bilinguals are those who start learning more than one language really early in life. And sequential are like, many of us who have moved to France from somewhere else and had to learn French later in life, or, or even um, people who learn one language to start out with and then another one in later childhood. Um, they have sequential bilinguals have one dominant language and one that's less good. And so the dominant language, <clears throat> well, I, let's, I'll go back to the, the simultaneous bilinguals because that's 
the reference point really, they process both of their languages in the same area of the brain, like the, this, the language area of the brain. They go back and forth really easily between these two languages, maybe because they're being processed in the same area. Whereas those of us who have a dominant language and a less dominant language um, actually recruit more brain resources for the less dominant language because it's harder when you want to form, for me, when I want to form a sentence in French, I have to work harder than when I want to form a sentence in English. Uh, but a simultaneous bilingual is not going to have this kind of extra extra work to do for either of their languages. And um, also for simultaneous bilinguals, their dominance can change over time. They're not going to always be equally good in both of their languages. So that's, um, I think some parents might be concerned about that if that happens. Like I noticed when my son was three, we took a trip to the US and we spent three weeks there. We came back. It was like he couldn't speak French anymore. And it maybe sort of concerned my mother-in-law a little bit, but it came back really fast. And this throughout their lifetimes, this uh, shift in dominance is gonna happen. Totally normal. This is um, off, off the cuff because we didn't prepare this question ahead of time, but if you don't mind me asking, can you define a little bit more where the cutoff might be for those descriptions of sequential and, um, yeah. and simultaneous bilinguals? Is there a cut and dry answer for that? Is That's it- tough. Um, I do you know, or do you want to? I don't know. I can speculate <laughs> um, because there are some aspects of language that are sort of solidified really early, uh, like certain um, discrimination between consonants and that sort of thing. That's really, really early. Um, but yeah, it, it can really depend. I think. To be a simultaneous bilingual, it has to really start, exposure has to start really early to both languages. Thanks, thank you. And can you tell us a little bit um, what's happening as a child is learning two or more languages, perhaps after, perhaps as a sequential bilingual, if you wanna focus on, on one, one of those groups, can you tell us what's happening as they're learning? Um, well, so, I want to kind of go back to the basics to talk about this. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard of neuroplasticity, uh, which is something we have, everyone has as a kid and we sort of lose as time goes on. So, so kids or infants are born with, I think, 100 billion neurons. And we all have a lot of neurons, but that's 15% more than they'll have when they're an adult. So over time, the brain connections are made as they're exposed to different things in the world. And the less important connections are pruned. It's called synaptic pruning. So, and it's just like pruning your rose bush. You get rid of the branches you don't want there, the ones you don't use. So it's, it's kind of like a muscle, like you use it or lose it. And over time, whatever the baby is exposed to, they're going to strengthen those connections that are necessary. So if they're exposed to two languages, they're gonna strengthen all the connections necessary for processing those two languages, and also for switching back and forth between the two languages, for knowing when to use which language, for remembering all of the different rules that go with each language. So there are a lot of, of extra things that are going on uh, when a, a kid is learning two or more languages. Or an adult. I mean, you touched on your yeah. language learning, which is similar to mine. So you would also recommend language learning for an adult? Definitely. Like I said, neuroplasticity decreases as we get older, but it never goes away. And it's always good for you uh, to be learning whatever, <laughs> exercise the brain. Um, there's actually bilinguals um, end up with what's called a, a cognitive reserve. And there are several studies showing that later in life, you um, can use this cognitive reserve, not on purpose, but it's there as a prevention or a delay at least for um, Alzheimer's and other dementia. So if you take brain scans of two people, one a, a bilingual and one monolingual, and say they have the exact same um, deterioration of their brains or the exact same plaques from Alzheimer's, the bilingual will be in much better shape functionally 
than the monolingual because they have these cognitive reserves that help them to cope with the dementia and, and it can delay it up to five years, I read in one spot. It doesn't prevent it, but it's, uh, it's good to exercise the brain. And I'm hoping most of these studies are done on simultaneous bilinguals, kids who learned more than one language really young, but um, there's some evidence it can also apply to us, <laughs> older bilinguals, and, uh, and especially if you use more than one language on your, in a daily life and just exercising those brain muscles. <laughs> well, that leads into another question I had, which was, is there a critical period for learning a second language? Is that something you found in your research? I mean, we know it's always beneficial. That's what you're telling us. But is there a critical period for learning it well or completely? Uh, there's so a critical period is is really a harsh kind of <laughs> word um, in in there's certain things that have a real critical period where after the cutoff it's just not possible anymore and that's not true of language learning so we, we can talk about a sensitive period where after which you um, become a lot less good at learning you can't ever lose your accent <laughs> that sort of thing um, and there was actually a study done really recently, the biggest study I've ever seen. It was over 600,000 people were tested. Uh, they, it was English speakers. Um, they filled out uh, a quiz online. Um, it was basically a grammar syntax test. And, uh, and then at the end of it, they asked people when they started learning English. So they found if they were... Uh, they had English as a second language or not. And through this, they, they correlated their ability to do this test and when they started learning English. And basically they showed that there's a kind of a decrease after 10 or age 10 or 12, um, but that also includes the time it takes to learn the language. So they estimated, I think five or six years so that would put the place where the decrease in ability really starts around 17. Okay. But there's still <laughs> hope to learn, perhaps. But, but you can definitely learn down. afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Like, I get by in French. I started at 28. <laughs> it's fine. And then you talked about the benefits um, in neuroplasticity, but studies have also shown that by being bilingual may result in more efficient and resilient executive control processes. So planning and task switching more so than monolinguals. Can you expand on that at all? Yeah, so planning as task switching, as you said, um, working memory, all sorts of things, because like I said, they're exercising these muscles all the time to know which language to use when, to switch back and forth between them. Uh, sometimes they switch in the middle of a sentence. It's just completely automatic because they use it all the time. And they can also apply this to other areas of their lives. So yeah, it helps them to uh, it, all sorts of areas like uh, math. Um, I have a list here I can tell you a bit more later. But there was one study that I found really interesting. Um, where they, they asked monolingual and bilingual kids um, to tell them whether a sentence was grammatical or not. And they asked the, the sentence, one example of the sentence they asked was apples grow on noses. And the monolingual kids said, well, no, that makes no sense. And they sort of stopped there. They couldn't say whether it was grammatically correct or not, but the bilingual kids um, were able to abstract past that and say, well, yeah, that makes no sense, but it is grammatically correct. Mm -hmm. And um, then there's another study done on uh, bilingual adults in a driving simulator, and they had them do random tasks at the same time. And the so it was, it was both monolingual and bilingual adults and the everybody got worse. So it's, it's not a good idea to do things while you're driving. But the bilingual adults, their performance decreased less than the monolingual adults. So it's not connected at all to language, but their ability to 
switch back and forth between their languages has helped them to multitask in a completely unconnected area. Because essentially they're already multitasking and having to analyze information every day. Is that yeah. the hypothesis? Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, so I know we have a lot of audience questions and we're gonna read some of those, but I wanted to wrap up our interview before I read some of the audience questions. So can you share a few insights that you would like everyone to hear? Is there anything that you've learned in your research that you think parents and educators would find helpful? Um, well, so I made a little list of the advantages because I know that it's a huge pain to add in an extra language when your kids are already tired from all the French homework they have and to, to do this bit of extra thing to ensure that they have enough exposure in whatever other language you want them to be learning. So just as a reminder of, of uh, all the good things that it you get from being bilingual. Um, so they can get have a higher phonemic awareness of sounds. Um, and this helps them to take words apart, uh, which is important for both reading and writing development. So that can all be made easier for them. Um, as I said, they have improved ability in math. Um, one study in four to five year olds showed better addition and number recognition, maybe because of their increased working memory um, due to being bilingual. Um, it gives them enhanced cultural awareness, just the fact that you know you speak two languages, you can communicate with different groups of people, you can understand that there are different cultures out there in the first place. Um, they often show better abstract thinking, creative creativity and cognitive flexibility. Uh, people who speak a second language are even thought of as more attractive. <laughs> it could be good later. Um, and, uh, and all these advantages can come from all sorts of different bilingual situations. So um, don't listen to anybody who's telling you there's only one way to do it, one parent, one language or whatever. There's, there's all sorts of different ways and each family is different and you have to find the way that works for your family. That's my message. <laughs> Thank you so much. So you're encouraging bilingualism and, and even if it gets hard, keep it up. Keep it up, yeah. Keep yeah. up the exposure, exposure is important. And um, I, I talk a lot about that here at the library. I think we're going to get into that with some of these questions. I see one, um, the first one I'm gonna read is that um, someone speaks three languages to their kids, but they speak only English with one another, the parents, and I, the mom, try to speak strictly another foreign language. I notice my son, who's three years old, replies and speaks to me a lot in English or French. What advice would help him speak to me in Viet, the language I speak with him strictly? Um, I notice my son yeah, replies to me only in English and French. So I guess what would encourage that third language? Um, since in this situation, the person, the child is clearly exposed to English and French more than that third language. Right, yeah. Do you have any tips? Um, there are, the, yeah, I have a, a few ideas. Um, you could, books are always good, reading books together in that third language. Um, if you can find friends of your son's age who, who speak the same language as well, having peers who also speak the language helps to show the importance. Um, traveling is not always possible, that's always good too uh zoom calls with family that also speak that language and just persistence generally keeping it up keeping up the exposure and yeah go ahead okay. it sounds like you're offering and suggesting a variety of things which correlates to some some things that i've read in research as well that it helps language development when you have exposure to a language in different scenarios um, Definitely, an emotional connection. Is, is that something we should keep in mind? Yeah, yeah. You need an emotional connection also to the person who's teaching you the language, especially true for little kids. Um, I think older kids can learn vocabulary and things from TV, but uh, a little kid needs to have uh, an emotional connection with a caregiver or a friend or whoever is speaking the language with them. Thank you. Um, 
This question comes from Claire, who says, I'd be interested to know why some simultaneous bilinguals from birth with strong exposure in both languages still have a dominant language and a slight accent. Um, there could be lots of reasons. Uh, like I said, the dominance changes over time, for sure. So it, even if you're born with two languages completely equally exposed to both, which is often not true either, there's often an imbalance in exposure, uh, later life factors can change uh, which language becomes dominant. And it, it's not only the very beginning of life that matters. Thanks for answering all of these for us, because I know you would have liked to go and dig into research before coming back. So um, thank you for jumping in. I know you know a lot and we're really happy to have you uh, share what you know here. There's another, another person, Alexandra, who says we're a minority language household. We have a child in Moyen section, so in preschool, who did not speak at school last year. And this year will mostly speak English to her teacher. What's the best way to support her? I'm assuming that means support her in her third language or in the minority language. Is that correct, Alexandra? Um, if you type in, we'll, we'll clarify. Um, so she's speaking English at school in a French school? It sounds like she's speaking English in a French school. Is that correct? We can come back to that one. Um, when we get okay. some clarification from you. Okay, Alexandra, type that in and then we'll, we'll go back to that. And then we've got another question here. Uh, someone here says, I read that it's possible for a person to be dyslexic in one language, but not another. Have you heard of this? I've never heard of that. Everything I've read says that the dyslexia should go apply to all languages. And so we have some clarification on the question about how to support this, this child who speaks English at home and she's in a French school. So I guess how to support the English. How to support English at home? Um, <laughs> the English, I think. In English. general, yeah. So, well, there, um, Beth mentioned the blog earlier, AEW blog. There are two posts on how to support English at home and, uh, and reading. Um, and then there are also, oh, support learning French. Is that oh. Alexandra? Okay. So you want to help her learn French because it's English at home and, uh, okay, yeah. And I, I guess both parents speak only English at home. So then the French is only from school. Yeah, that can be tricky. Um, especially if the child is not the most outgoing and feels uncomfortable and uh, every kid is different. I know yeah, it can be it can be tough to encourage them at school. I, I guess it's the same thing I would say for uh, the the other question about supporting the third language. If you can get any support from someone, I don't know if you feel comfortable in French, like learning French with your daughter, or if you know people who would be happy to come in and read books with her or play with her in French just a, in a comfortable situation, somebody she feels at ease with uh, that could help her feel more comfortable in French and then maybe she would feel better speaking at school. It's just an idea. And there's someone here who says um, that she speaks English exclusively with her daughter when it's just the two of us because she mm -hmm. is an English speaker and um, she, speaks in, she speaks English fluently with almost no accent. So. Um, she and her husband are both French, and mm -hmm. she wants to help her daughter distinguish, I'm speaking English with mom, I'm speaking French with dad. She says, am I doing this right, or is there a risk of her mixing up the languages? I think you're doing just fine. The, and kids do mix. It's totally normal when they mix. Um, my, I have two boys, and one never mixed, and the other mixed languages all the time. So it also it depends on the personality, um, but yeah, she'll, she'll sort it out. It won't be a problem. We have heard a few questions or seen a few come through the chat about kids switching. And at least three parents have typed in that they wanna know a solution or some tips for helping their kids so that they don't switch and mix languages. It looks like we're talking about 
kids who mix languages with one person. Maybe they speak French and English in the same sentence or another, another two languages in the same sentence or phrase. I guess it depends on when they're doing it, but it's not necessarily a problem. <laughs> and maybe if, if you give me an example of where it's uh, causing problems, I, I don't think it's necessarily a problem that needs a solution. It could be something that works itself out in time. Um, for example, I can bring a little bit of personal experience to that mm -hmm. one because my daughter's four and occasionally she'll do that in a situation where the other person doesn't understand English and she'll throw in okay. an English word. So I think a lot of parents here have probably had the same experience where they feel like their child assumes they're in a bilingual environment. Um, yeah. You think it'll iron itself out after a certain- yeah, I mean, correct in the moment, like say no, like this is not a French word or this is not an English word and, and give them the correct one for the context. And I think it'll, yeah, they'll figure it out. Here we have um, another one from, from an educator who asks, there's a lot of literature out there for adults about bilingualism for parents and educators. Do you know of anything for kids? Mm. <laughs> Um, for li literature for, I guess I don't understand the question exactly. I think we might be asking for literature for children to read on their own. About bilingualism? For about kids bilingualism. to read themselves. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Celeste, you would be the one who <laughs> would know more about that. We, I mean, we have some, we have some books that are side by side bilingual and you see that sometimes but um more and more for people who speak english and spanish we'll see books where spanish is integrated into a story there's a wonderful a wonderful story about mercy suarez which won the newberry award and she mixes languages in the book i don't know that in french um but we can we can go on and on. Don't get me started on books. <laughs> we'll take it back to you. So um, we have another question here. Um, for those of us who have been through raising our bilingual children, at some point we may have been criticized by our child in a public place because we're not speaking to them in the country language. How should we have handled that moment? Um, if the kid will go along with it, you could say it's our super secret spy language. It depends on the age of the kid, but they might find that fun. And this it's just for us to talk and nobody else can understand. Um, otherwise, if, I mean, if they're a teenager, it's just them being a teenager. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's also part of them growing and discovering their world and realizing that, you know, not everybody speaks this language that my parents speak to me and, and, and they figure out that some people only speak one language and it's all part of just discovering who they are and where they fit in the world. And so someone else here asks, when a child is learning many languages and sometimes mixes, when do you usually expect them to eventually grow out of switching and understand how to separate those languages. Do you, can you? I don't know. Normal. Actually, yeah. I, normal's not the right word to use here. I think either. I'm I'm positive there is a lot of variation. I I, I don't think there would be a, an age, um, but I don't know exactly what age approximately. Um, yeah. Let's take one or two more questions if you have time. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. So someone here says, hello, Dr. Murard. In order to maintain good exposure to English, do you recommend a focus on one accent at a time or varied accent as soon as possible? Um, if you have varied accents in your circle and people that your child cares about and enjoys being with, then there's no problem at all exposing the child to those. It's just important to have a lot of exposure um, and they'll they'll figure out the accents they might end up pronouncing words strangely sometimes but that also they'll figure it out eventually <laughs> um, but there's no reason to introduce extra accents but um, if that's what you have it's it's fine great it all depends on your own personal situation too right 
what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Here we have someone who asks about writing. Um, and is it okay if I insist that my 10 year old learns to read and write in our native language, which has a different script than Roman? He's managing. Yeah, uh, for sure. I think it's, it's great. It's um, when you have a home language, that's different from the main language, your child could become bilingual without being biliterate. And it's that bit of extra work you need to put in to help your child become literate in that language as well. So it's, it's important, it's, especially if that's important to you, then it's definitely something that you should do. And then there's an interesting question here too, because we've talked a little bit about one person, one language, or um, so the mother speaking English and the father speaking mm -hmm. French or, or another language. Someone asks, can you explain a little bit about different methods you might have heard of on how to teach several languages apart from one person, one language? Do you, can you the, tell us anything about what you've come across? The, the main one that I know, um, which is kind of what we use in my family, is the, the home language um, and then the outside language. Uh, because even though my husband is French, we end up, when we're all having a conversation together, it ends up being mostly in English. So he's always mixed the two languages talking to the kids. And, and it's, that's what's worked out best for us. Um, I'm sure there are other, uh, other ways of, of putting together, especially when there are more than two languages. Like I know I have friends who, she was Hungarian, he's um, Argentinian, and they spoke English together. And then the child went to school in French and it's a lot of different input. And um, I think for the kids, English was probably the their least good language because they only really heard that when their parents were speaking to each other. But they, they, they figured it out somehow. <laughs> Speaking one one parent spoke each language to the child, and then there was also the outside language, and they they sorted out. You're very encouraging. It's great to hear because I think this crowd is all about bilingualism, and it's just nice to hear reassurance that it's normal to hear a child switch languages um, in one phrase. Um, they might push back a little bit. You keep it up, right? Um, yep. keep it up, give them time in each language, give them experiences. And um, one last question, maybe you can answer this. I'm curious to hear the answer if you can. The, this person asks, what's the difference between passive language acquisition and active language acquisition? Uh, passive language acquisition is like, uh, I know what a lot of immigrants kids end up experiencing um, in the US. I know when I was growing up and they weren't so excited about bilingualism, uh, they can understand their parents native language because their parents speak it to them all the time but they don't learn it so they can speak it as well. So it's uh, like just a yeah, passive understanding of the language which is also beneficial. It's just a, a different level of, of bilingualism. And then active would be, how would you define active language? Active would be using it, able to use it expressively and, and to communicate with other people. So the difference is being able to actually speak it's the a, language. Yeah, it, basically being able to understand it only or being able to speak it as well. And, use and it. I hope to have you back again soon, Anjali. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you to Beth and AAWE for organizing this event with us. And thank, thank you, you for asking your questions. Bravo, thank you for being here. Have a great evening and we hope to see you all again soon.